<clears throat> Hello. Hello. <laughs> hmm. Wonderful to see all of you. Oh boy. Hmm. Wow. Caroline from Habi, yay. <laughs> hmm. I don't think that's Caroline from Javi. Oh, Caroline. Another from Caroline. Yes. Oh, Hello. right. Right, you're right. <laughs> yeah. Wonderful yeah. to see folks. Hi. Yeah. So take the time, Caroline M. Take your time to just see everyone as part of our Sangha, yeah, taking the time. all the different time zones, and climates. Okay. I was just teaching in person last week and um, it feels like a relief to see you back all on Zoom. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> More about that later. <laughs> all right, I'll be quiet. Okay, so um, in light of the holiday uh, season, um, just letting your attention settle within your body and the space around your body. And remembering that there is a visual image of your body that will probably come up in the thought process, the memory of it. It could be black and white or in color. It could be a part of your body like a hand or the whole body. But just however that happens, remember that that's just thinking or remembering, and that's fine, of course. We're very visually oriented human beings. And to allow that to happen as we connect our attention as much as we can to the direct experience of the body sensations. And often if we feel disconnected, it's helpful to find some quiet caring for yourself as a human being on this planet, care or kindness. Sometimes those might be too strong a word and it could be just a very quiet tenderness for our vulnerability that we never know what's going to happen next, that we all share. And if you can, the emphasis today is on the receiving of what's appearing. So if any quiet tenderness or care appears or kindness for your body, mind, or heart, just notice if you're receiving it. And sometimes we can actually start to receive the kindness, care, quiet, tenderness within our body, the cells in our body, the, our bones. Maybe that might be a few moments, but it can feel like 
out of that mindfulness of the body sensations in the present moment, a direct experience of warmth or pressure or heat. Out of that receiving of the aliveness of your body sensations themselves moment by moment with care, there might be some appreciation or gratitude. for life itself. Genuine. We get, it doesn't matter if it's pleasant, unpleasant or neutral feelings, it's feeling tone, it's the gift of our body, mind, heart. as we're here on the planet to learn. So just knowing we can just, for example, let the attention settle within our hands. Often the visual image will come. That's fine, appreciating that. Sometimes it's just we might notice some tingling, the life of our body, or numbness. Numbness is part of the life of our body. Or tightness. So just that connecting, maybe some light care. And noticing if we really receive this aliveness. Sometimes we might feel some gratitude. It's not ours. Earth, air, fire, and water the gifts of the life of our body. With our, the movement of our breath at the abdomen, sometimes we can put these the aliveness of these hands there on our belly, your abdomen. And it's like waiting for this great gift to appear. The breath of life. And as we know, the words can get in the way of our direct experience. They can help us connect. Then it's that quiet, tender, receiving of air. It's not ours. It's alive. Air is also just a word for these moment to moment changing sensations. Sometimes it's 
we might see that we're wanting more, we're trying too hard, we're wanting less, we want it maybe to be shallow or deep, not tight, more relaxed. It's just seeing if it can be just enough, just as it is. Worthy of our attention, not worthless. Noticing it disappear. And appear. And this with our sound, the hearing whether it sounds inside our body or outside. It's no inside, no outside, just vibrations and textures of hearing coming and going by themselves. The genuine, very light gratitude can come from receiving them directly, just as they're happening, not a memory. We can apply this understanding with seeing, and smelling, tasting. taking time we can be grateful for the mindfulness of thinking and the care, tenderness, that we can notice the thoughts come and go like the breath or sound. They're not ours. the gift of not having to believe the content of the storyline. But no need to push them away, get rid of them. Sometimes when they're repeating, 
we might be missing that range of sad, happy, angry, grateful, compassion, fear, loneliness, joy, equanimity, peace, resistance. Receiving the direct experience of sensations in our bodies that come with the range of thought, body sensation within emotion, including numbness. Being grateful, we can care. That we can receive all aspects of our being. Grateful for the wisdom to not be caught up and the story about it, but not rejecting the story. Just let it come and go. Like the sound of a bird.
Thank you, Michelle. Your bell used to pierce through Zoom's dampening systems, but now it's getting dampened. Yeah, we'll, we'll work on that. I know for you, for you both. Mm. Steve and I, Zoom have been dampened <laughs> <laughs> for some reason out of our control. Mm. Oh. Well, yeah, really good to see everybody. Hope everyone's doing okay. The season deepens. As I was saying, I was uh, just got back yesterday from California, where I had uh, taught a retreat. Some folks here were there. Um, and yeah, it was the first, you know, I had, we've done a day long, uh, a little over a month ago in Massachusetts, but this is the first time really since the pandemic that pretty much any of us had been in that kind of um, situation of a large group of practitioners and overnight for, it was like seven days, five full days, you know, of practice. And um, yeah, amazing, you know, just something for sure hitting home in a different way of just what it's been like for all of us in different ways and some shared ways and especially around this practice and some of the ways that we had become accustomed of course to practicing together and and then some of the ways that we've adapted and um you know i think we've been very clear really this whole time of just how appreciative and valuable we felt that the technology has been being able to do it on zoom and some of these other online platforms that we've used and um how much we've gained in terms of a sense of continuity with people you know where as we've said you know maybe you'd see folks once a you know once a year maybe twice a year and now it's yeah it's like every uh every weekend or more or less um And then something of 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 the value, of course, of being in a physical presence together, physical space, and and for me, I, I really was like one of the most moving parts was just in this past year, a lot of our multi-day programs we haven't been able to have um, really new students. You know, of course, anyone's welcome to the Sunday sitting or some of the kind of shorter programs, but we really felt that you know, for a longer program, a nine day self retreat is pretty intense. And, and if people hadn't done some retreats in person, you know, in a kind of retreat center with guidance, with some experience with that beforehand, it just didn't feel safe really to have people or appropriate to, it's because it's very hard to manage your time, you know, even as a very experienced yogi in a lot of people, it's like, oh gosh, it's a, a different world. And people have gotten a lot of value of that uh, over time. And we've been really happy to, really happy, excited to train people in that sense of self-retreat and the flexibility and all of the things that have come with that. But it's all just to say that of the 80 people um, at this retreat, about 40 were brand new um, to to retreat practice. Um, and that was just amazing, you know, it was so super cool and just fun. And, and of course, hard, you know, it's hard being a yogi. <laughs> you know, people, people were so earnest and so um, dedicated and trusting and went with it. And, you know, I've, you know, we did, of course, try to provide a lot of support in the ways we could, but um, uh, amazing. And, and of course, um, something hopeful and inspiring and enlivening in that, you know, and uh, to have that that experience. And apparently over there at Spirit Rock, that's basically the case for a lot of the retreats coming up. It's maybe not quite so much, but a lot of them, it's like a third of all the new students are, are new, really new to retreat practice. So it's neat. Um, but I, it also gives you, you know, if teaching, it, it adds another sort of interesting perspective on some of what we do. And um, one of the things that I was just really 
that was like really impressed upon to me was just that that dance for us of like how much we try to communicate in terms of the practice and in terms of method, in terms of the frameworks and and how much you just need to just sort of trust the practice to keep unfolding and that there's only so much explanation that you can do um, that's helpful or that isn't confusing, um, that doesn't just sort of add to more like cluck, 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 you know. Uh, definitely one of the things was interesting because we're not even aware of this. Like one of the very um, typical common things you'll see in the suttas is the Buddha talking about the five aggregates, form, feeling, mental formations, perception, consciousness. <laughs> I'm getting them in right order. You know, the translations are always a little different, but we almost never use those as a, as a teaching frame right even for experienced students because it's it's like every single one of those is is a framework that's like a little bit the translation is complicated and it has meanings outside of any direct english word and there's places where they don't align or they overlap and why those five things you know and so we talked about some of these on retreat form is a little easier in the sense that it can be basically understood as like physicality, you know, body, rupa. But as you many of you know, feeling or feeling tone, this idea of pleasant, unpleasant, neutral, um, that it's different than the word feelings we tend to use. And like that means basically like emotions, right? And that Vedana is different than emotions. And so it's like, okay, you get that there's something where we're going to use a word that we're used to meaning one thing and we're going to have it mean something that's like totally different. And you can do some of that, but at some point it gets confusing, you know, perception, this sense of, um, it's not just seeing, right. But it's the notional overlay, the conceptual overlay on what we're seeing or what we're hearing, the, the, the perceived experience versus the direct experience. It's like a little bit different, you know, uh, mental formations in the five aggregates and then, Sankara outside of the five aggregates, you know, this idea of like volitional impulses, volitional moments around mind uh, that influence mind, body, speech, um, the sort of the, the seeds of kama, karma, you know, or this is the broader sense of, of Sankara of just formations of that we experience in, in all of the sense stores that are arising and passing out of our control and and how those are might be actually related in terms of intention and then what we're intention in this moment and what we're experiencing from past moments it's like it starts to get a little bit like much you know and consciousness as uh in english that con it's a very vague term really in terms of how most of us use it at least i'm sure for neuroscientists it means something very specific but that it also means something very specific, really, in Pali, you know, what the word is translated as in terms of knowing, the jnana, and, and yet is still overlapping with all these things. So the point is, is just what happened right now. It's like, blah, 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 blah. It's like all this stuff, and it's this sort of like soup of notions that's like interesting because you get that it's hard to understand what you're experiencing in your meditation practice. And the notions obviously have a place in helping us understand it, but that at times they can just start to be, there's so many ways, there's so many things, pieces of the framework, and there's so many ways that the word we're using is different than the word we're tend to, we tend to use it as, and that it just adds confusion. So anyway, it was at the end of the course, a lot, there were a lot of these kinds of questions. It was like, well, you know, who's knowing? If there's no, who is this consciousness? If there's no self, you know, classic things that like someone who might have been practicing for 60 years is still unclear on, right? It's like, it feels like there's a self, you know, it feels like that ball just hit me in the head or whatever, you know? Um, and so anyway, this sense of... Um, that was such a relief for me to come to at the end of this course and be able to say, and, and something that I feel like I've, I've been, it feels important in general to everyone of just how important it is to not think about it too much and to be, um, to just get this basic fact that like mental suffering is coming from the fact that we are not really seeing things clearly. 
And so the practice is just trying to look more closely. And that, that's pretty much it. You know, there's, there's a lot of like method, there's a lot of frameworks, there's a lot of reasons why it's like, of course, more complicated and things get complex. Um, and there are good reasons. And we have a lot of confidence in those frameworks and in the, you know, the ability to apply method and, um, and all of that. But just like where, especially in our daily lives, because as a, you know, as you're a yogi on retreat, that can feel like a good reminder of like, okay, right. We're listening to Dhamma talk and it feels a little conceptual or we're listening to instructions and it feels conceptual, but then we get to go back to just like observing all the time. That's our job as a yogi on retreat. It's harder in daily life because this, you can see why sometimes the frameworks help because it's little like reminders, little tricks, little like kind of uh, things that can sort of help us when we're living more in the conceptual level of things. And we're not protected enough in our daily lives to just sit and watch. But on the other hand, it's important to just see and remember that no matter what questions we have about practice or about, you know, what we should do with our lives or various conundrums that we have, things that are difficult, um, things that we want, that the most important answer is always just going to be to look more closely, you know, try to look more closely because it's really just a matter of misperceiving, right? Of, of, of not seeing clearly. And so the perception of what we're seeing is not in alignment maybe with what's always really happening. And where is that something that we're remembering to do, right? That we're not just sort of like, mm, like it's not just like a discipline of like, oh, just remember everything's impermanent or just remember you can't control everything or, Remember, you know, these ways that we sort of remind ourselves to be like in alignment with the Dhamma in our daily lives when we're involved in all these other things. But where is the sense of just being like, oh, can I actually observe this? And knowing that sometimes that can create a little social awkwardness, right? Or there's a, there is a sense of like, you need to kind of pause maybe of like the argument you're in or whatever and be like, I'm trying to actually, I want to see what's really going on for me because it's not. I can see that something isn't quite right or something isn't clear and I'm acting out of that or, or what have you, you know, we just get in our little whirlwinds. And in some ways that's the value of things being so repetitive um, because it means we get another chance and another chance and another chance to look at it. Sometimes of course that's the suffering is that we keep mulling over the same material, but how important it actually it is because of this, and so all this is a, this is getting into method and conceptual stuff. So I'm sorry, but it is I'll offer it as a thing, which is to say, if you're gonna try to remember to observe more in life and be, it's like try to see more clearly what's happening. To remember, one of the most fundamental things about this practice is that it's not like a pressure. Right, it's like, oh, I should look more, I wanna be able to see more clearly what's happening. When you say that, is there a sense of like, you're pushing harder? There's a strain, there's a tension, like, Ur, like you're trying to dig in. Um, and really this practice is not one where you're sort of like trying to get through layers, where it's like, you're not seeing clearly because you're, you're stuck on this level, but there's something happening deeper, right? That's the sort of framework we tend to live in. But with, in, in, in Vipassana, it's especially in our lineage, it's momentary, right? It's like in this moment, what's apparent? In this moment, what's apparent? In this moment, what's apparent? Not digging around, not needing to, you know, go below or get underneath or ignore the obvious and go to something that's like less obvious. It's noting the obvious and noting the obvious. And the more clearly we note the obvious, the more, the stronger, the more supple, the more profound the mindfulness gets so that you start to see things that are less obvious. You start to see the subtle moments of aversion or tension, of not wanting, of mind and body interacting in ways that are complicated and difficult to manage. And so the answer is, is in this sort of the seeing things on a momentary level still, not in the sort of quote unquote deeper way of like, oh, I need to dig in and push harder and, and, and force the mind to see something in this tight way. It's like, oh, where there might need to be more lightness, more nimbleness, more agility, more dexterity of mind and persistence, right? It is the continuity and concurrence of attention 
that allows for insight to happen. But just that simplicity of like, oh, being interested in what's happening. Oh, there's aversion, there's anger, there's something unpleasant, there's wanting, there's a fantasy, there's an engrossment with that, right? There's an enchantment with some object that is here or is a future object. And where can we watch that without judgment? You know, just as we would if we were on retreat or in a more protected space, where do we find the ability to, to keep looking more closely? And what that means is just persistently and lightly, but in a committed way, you know? I want to, here we go. In the name of that, in the name of like, sort of just simplicity and, and also as Michelle was bringing up this um, gratitude and that we're in a period of, uh, many people in the United States are in a period of preparing for a time called Thanksgiving. And, um, you know, we all have very, we have different relationships with that. Uh, there's, so just to be aware, of course, right, that people in Canada also have this thing called Thanksgiving at a different time. <laughs> and I know many of you are up there. Many people in the States do not celebrate Thanksgiving. Many people have a very complicated relationship to the sort of story that's behind it. Um, of course, people in other countries may or may not have a relationship to that or know about it, or it's in the sort of like Halloween realm of like one of these American things that happens. Um, without getting into all of that in detail, the idea that there is a day where we think about what we're thankful for <laughs> is actually like, you know, a nice idea. And, um, and there are people who have made good practice out of that. My family never, maybe a few times we did that thing where like people go around the table and for you, you're supposed to, the food is there and everyone wants to eat and you have to go around and say what you're thankful for, you know. Uh, we might have done it a few times. And, and I think it's one of those things where it's like, it can feel forced, but there's something still lovely that can come out of that, of like people in a public way expressing their gratitude, you know? And um, this sense of what are we grateful for? And can we be grateful for the, you know, as Michelle was instructing us of like, you know, the pleasant, unpleasant and neutral range of, experiences and is there is there some sense of appreciation even for the things that are hard um as a aside i was when i was in california i visited with a friend who's much more familiar with some of like the other some other schools of, of buddhism like the pure land schools and um you know, some of them have a very, of course, profound practice around gratitude and, and you know, anything that happens, like, can you be grateful for everything? You know, the, all the sorrow and joy and pain and in our lives and the sense of um, how hard a practice that really is, you know, of, of being so grateful, trying to be grateful and saying that uh, namo amida, Utsu, right? Every time. So anything, anything happens that you, even is difficult, the sense of gratitude. Um, I've been re-looking at a sutta that is really powerful for me and it's related. Um, and it's powerful me, for me for a bunch of things, but part of it is the simplicity. It's going back to like, there's all this complexity, there's all these like nuances and techniques and complexity of all the the Dhamma and the, the Dhamma teachings that are amazing and, and wonderful and so supportive. And then where are the times where it's like very simple and, um, and where is that simplicity, something that's actually very helpful and clear. So um, here we go. This is the Mangala Sutta, very famous Sutta. And um, it's a discourse that the Buddha gave 
also is something that is chanted in a lot of Theravada Buddhist countries, like the Metta Sutta or the Ratana Sutta, as part of these um, parittas or kind of protective verses. And um, I won't go into a lot of that, um, but it's an interesting sort of aspect of the tradition, right? Where a lot of times there's sort of like something miraculous was to have happened when these suttas happened, you know, in the stories of the suttas. And so there's a way that they are, we kind of rehearse miracles, right? Like in all traditions and all cultures do this on some degree, we rehearse miracles to try to kind of like get back into that potential for uh, whatever happened there. And so this is this very powerful discourse on blessings, which I'll just read and then talk about a little bit. Thus I have heard at one time the Blessed One was dwelling at the monastery of Anathambika Pindika in Jeddah's Grove near the city of Savati. Then a certain deity at the late night was with surpassing splendor, having illuminated the entire Jeddah's Grove, came to the Blessed One. Drawing near, the deity respectfully paid homage to the Blessed One, stood at a suitable distance, and then addressed the Blessed One in verse. Many deities and people desiring for happiness have pondered upon the meaning of blessings. Please explain to me what the highest blessing is. And then the Buddha responds, not to associate with fools, to associate with the wise and honor those who are worthy of honor. This is the highest blessing. To live in a suitable place, to have done the meritorious actions in the past and properly to keep one's mind and body. This is the highest blessing. To have much knowledge, to be skilled in crafts, to be well-trained in discipline and to have good speech. This is the highest blessing. Looking after one's mother and father, supporting one's partner and children, and having an occupation that causes no confusion. This is the highest blessing. Generosity, righteous conduct, supporting one's relatives and blameless actions. This is the highest blessing. Abstaining from evil thoughts, abstaining from evil deed and speech, restraint from intoxicants, and not neglecting wholesome acts. This is the highest blessing. Being respectful, humble, contented, grateful, and listening to the Dhamma at a suitable time. This is the highest blessing. Being patient, obedient, meeting monks and discussing the Dhamma on suitable occasions. This is the highest blessing. Having subdued evil actions, leading a noble life, seeing the noble truths and the realization of Nibbana, this is the highest blessing. The mind of a worthy one confronted with the eight worldly conditions is not shaken. It is sorrowless, stainless, and secure. This is the highest blessing. Having fulfilled such blessings, these beings are victorious everywhere and gain happiness everywhere. These are the highest blessings for them. Here ends the discourse on the blessings. Uta sati lokadami chitam yasa na kampati asokam miharam kemang etam mangala mutanam. It's very beautiful to hear it chanted as well, maybe. Sometime we'll do that. And to practice the chanting as a way to remember the words. And of the many things that could be talked about with that, I think I'll just keep it simple. And I think what I find so powerful and beautiful and surprising in it, um, as I think many do, is that word blessings is Buddha is, is transforming that notion, right? When we think of what are we thankful for? Or what are the blessings and we count our blessings? What are the things that we're thankful for in our lives? This sense of things that we have, have been granted to us, right? And that we don't have responsibility for. And 
uh, of course, there is a value in that and recognizing privilege or recognizing the things that we outside of our own actions are creating have, have been of benefit to us. There is something beautiful in that, of course. And in this, every single one of those is not about that. They're all about taking responsibility for our actions, right? Taking care of our elders, being diligent in speech, being realizing Nibbana, being, I mean, all of them, it's all, and they're all like, these are the highest blessings. And none of them are things that like just happen. They're all things that we actually have to do and be responsible for. And it is ultimately this teaching on kama, karma of, of this sense of whatever our actions, wholesome or unwholesome, that we will be their heir. You know, we are the inheritors of our own deeds, our own actions. And something quite powerful in this insistence that the highest blessings are these, you know, dedicated and, and committed um, endeavors of uh, ethical conduct, um, you know, goodwill, the, the doing that which is beneficial, you know, dana, sila, and bhavana, the restraint from harmful action, and then bhavana, the, the realization of the noble truths, and the realization of nibbana, the, the understanding, the coming to uh, disentangle the mind, you know, that, that this is the true meaning of blessings, and that these are the highest blessings, and that they are things that we are entirely responsible for in our own lives and in the world around us. And um, yeah, what a powerful teaching that is. I will, um, ah, I will put, hold on. I see Carolyn has a question here. Caroline. So there is a, is that the right link I just put in? Yeah, okay. There is one, uh, link right there in the chat if folks want to look at the Mangala Sutta in more detail. That's one translation um, uh, to check out. Um, but I think, again, there's just like this sense of the simplicity of it. It's like, what is the highest blessing? And, you know, in the, in the beginning part of, it's not always in the Sutta, but in the, in the Paritta, It starts off with saying, you know, people and deities for 12 years have tried to find out the meaning of the blessings. They couldn't find out the meaning of the 38 blessings that are a cause of happiness. Oh, good people, let us recite those blessings which destroy all evil, taught by the deity of deities for the benefit of beings. So this, just this sense of like, people are always trying to figure out where are the blessings, what are the blessings, what are the blessings, and like, and theorizing and, and, and the, the simplicity of what the Buddha said. It's just like doing good things, taking care of your parents, learning crafts, like having work that doesn't hurt anybody or create confusion. You know, like it's actually not that complicated. Don't, don't harm people, be nice, <laughs> be good, and, and try to observe the mind. You know, just try to really see what's happening in mind and body. And, and to see that, like, you, again, the, the carefulness around how much pressure, there's going to be things we don't see clearly. It's not always clear, but that's okay. We just know, oh, I don't really know what that is. I can't really tell what's going on, given right now the conditions. But you have some sense that something is going on that you're not seeing. And so there's a trigger for perhaps a little more patience, a little more kindness, a little bit more um, carefulness with our conduct, because we see perhaps that we're triggered around something that could lead to unwholesome actions. And so it's just like this, this real simplicity of how complicated the world is, how complicated our lives can be, how complicated everything can be. And um, sometimes how simple the answer is and how simple the resolution is. Uh, it's important to remember. So uh, that's that for now. And, um, you know, as usual, we do have some time for um, questions and um, about your practice, about the instructions, about the talk, um, anything that might be um, of help. And even if I might have said to keep things simple, we're happy to dig into it with you if that would be supportive. Just as 
uh, Gloria and Dave did. If you want to raise your Zoom hand, the bottom of the screen, where usually where it says more, or no, not more, reactions, um, there's a little button there that um, uh, you can raise your hand and we'll know you have a question. So yeah, let's start with um, David and Gloria. I wanted to express my uh, deep gratitude to both of you, Jesse and Michelle, and this community, which I really hold dearly. And um, also, Michelle, in your instructions, sparked a couple of things for me that I just wanted to mention. One is that um, being very grateful for mindfulness because it has offered me the opportunity um, to choose whether to identify with the, um, the mind and some of its storytelling and so forth. And it just seems like that's such incredible uh, gift of freedom. Um, and then secondly, um, grateful for your invitation um, that I took as an uh, invitation to contemplate that when you, when you said the phrase, um, we're on this earth to learn, and you just left it at that, um, that's something I really want to contemplate further. So thank you so much. I think I just wanted to um, thank you, David, and I just wanted to um, maybe accentuate that um, we're not usually taught from a young age that we're here to learn. And so that's where we often will get messed up around pleasure, pain, or neutral, the, the Vedana, and that um, uh, I think somehow so much of the motivation in life will be to learn if it keeps pain it away, <laughs> you know, and I, and so I think that that understanding that um, the mindfulness is the gift because it helps us to cut through that pleasure pain prison and to really get that you know we're here to learn from everything that appears <clears throat> so yeah i think that's uh it's not as easy a path <laughs> but it's uh, much more um liberating and i think i just want to add to that sense of like what you just described is really important of like, in terms of what I was saying about, you may not be having like profound insight into non-self of every emotion or thought in the moment, but you have had enough experience to see times where you do see thought as conditioned, right? Where it's, you don't, and the, the, identify, the process of identification with a thought or an emotion or a pattern of thoughts as painful and as conditioned and not necessarily true on a fundamental level, that that has enough impact in a moment that you still remember some truth about it later on when you're in the midst of something. And I just think it's just like an important thing to reflect where it's like you don't, the mindfulness which isn't always just in the context. It's like mindfulness and clear comprehension. Sometimes there's like powerful mindfulness of, you know, insight at any experience. But then there's other times of recognizing of like, oh, this is a certain thought. There's, there's something painful about it. It's a, maybe you would say there's something unwholesome in terms of its negative or clinging qualities or, or what have you. And that reminder that it's, oh, right, we know on some level that it's not me and my thought, and that reminder can help unhook. But also to see that as like a distinct process from the, like the, the, the mindful 
kind of insight moments that we might have of experiencing that truth, but that the truth can sort of pervades in other ways that are, you know, essentially part of our ethical practice, right? Of like, oh, not wanting to keep repeating a certain rhythm pattern internally or in the world around us. And that sort of restraint that comes from memory, right? Which is part of what that, you know, sati, the word we translate as mindfulness has to do with remembrance and that there is that aspect of how it's playing out right now. Yeah, it's great. Mm. Arlene? Let's see. Oh, you know what? I have to turn on. I have to let you guys unmute yourselves. There we go. There. Ah, that's what I didn't do last time. <laughs> <laughs> There's ah. something in common, Michelle. <laughs> uh. <laughs> Uh, it's good to be back. Um, I, I was, Rob and I were on this 10 day retreat with Amalia. Um, and part of um, the Anapadasati um, Sutra, um, there's an emphasis on joy. And um, in my practice now, there's a lot of sorrow. And, and awareness, and I feel the sorrow um, within my body, which is unusual for me. Normally I'm very in my head. And, um, and during the practice I was able, it was hard, but I was able to kind of follow what Michelle, I've learned from you about how to do it for so long. And then I watched Downton Dan Dan Abbey, which was perfect. Um, but I, I realized that um, what I am doing as a mother is I'm trying I am doing this, uh, but and it's so counter to how I used, have been in the world is to let go and to it not in my whole family. It's to. Uh, not say blah, 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 or are you sure you want to, I don't know. And also in terms that there's an aspect of somehow I, I feel the judgment of not being a good mother by not saying my blah, 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 blah. And it's been really clear that that's what's wanted. And so for me, it's kind of, it, it, staying with the sadness is okay, is, is really quite wonderful. But what comes up is a judgment of well, then I'm not a good mother and then I'm not a good grandmother. And it's not like I, I used to be a, a family therapist, okay? It, it's not like my whole life was, um, was being a mother or a spouse or a, so, so there's this way of letting go and which which in, in some ways is really lovely. <laughs> so there's this, this kind of crying and letting go. And I just giggled for a second <laughs> of, and, and, and so in terms of the practice, there is this opening up in the body and there's this, sadness and there's this feeling of it 
and there's Thanksgiving, which you know, which fortunately we're not we're we're going to friends, um, but. So, and I have been really good at being able to pretend and, and to be, you know, everybody's happy or they're talking about the Grateful Dead, I'm talking about the Grateful Dead, but there's this sadness, there's this sadness that I'm conscious of uh, while I'm doing it. So there it is. <laughs> Anything you can say, I really would appreciate it, both of you. And I do, do, do so appreciate the two of you and Steve. Do you want, Jesse, I'll start. I think that you're describing a shift in identity. And that's incredible. Most people can't do that. At, you know, when we get old, it's harder to, you know, they, they almost like become cemented and, um, and that it's so inspiring that you can attempt to shift identity. And I think that when we do that, we fall into often a sadness because it's such a loss it's such a loss and it's a loss for everybody. It's not just ourselves, but it's a loss for the kids or the grandkids. It's like our, the partner, it's like, um, and you're going into unknown territory and there's a grief process in doing it, even though it's actually a growth process, you're growing, but there's a, there's a, there's definitely um, sort of like with insight, as we get insight, there's often a, a grief process and, understanding the world in a different way we have to let go of what we used to believe it's the same it's this is like a result arlene of of your understanding it's a result that you don't have to stay stuck in this identity so of course it's unfamiliar of course you're going to be sad and i think it sounds like um you just need to be cheered on <laughs> <laughs> I cheer you on. I can tell you that I have an older friend than us that has been like has gone through that. Um, uh, this woman that lived across the street from me in Framingham, you know, and um, my mom, my mom died when I was young. And she was like, I think she didn't want to take me on as a mom, but she definitely took me on as a spiritual friend. And when I graduated from high school, I'll never forget this. This was so painful. Um, she wouldn't let me call her Mrs. So-and-so. She wanted me to call her by her first name. And I just started sobbing. And I'm like, no, I don't. <laughs> you're, like, you're like the lady across the street, right? That helped me. You know, like I wanted to keep her in a different role and identity and she would have nothing to do with it. Like I was 17 and she's like smashed. She smashed it. She just smashed it. And I was just like unbelievably sad. And then eventually so grateful that I, she treated me like a peer and she wanted me, she didn't want the role. She wanted me to be her peer. And then as recently she's done it, she keeps doing it with her kids, with her grandkids. She keeps smashing the role and um, she goes through tremendous sadness and her kids have, but I think um, it's a very delicate process, but it's liberating. Yeah. Children need to be held in that ro role. And then at some point, it's time <laughs> time for a change. So great, that's what I say, yeah. Cheering you on. Yeah, I, I wanna be careful not to like over like muddy what Michelle just said, because that's like the most important thing. But I, I think I do wanna just add, yeah, that it's, It's wonderful, really, and and to not dismiss the the, the pain of that, 
of of your seeing exactly why people stay in samsara right why people stay in the in all of the conflictual nagging to abusive to just entangled relationships that we have because that fills some place of feeling connected and being needed or you know it's very complex all the whatever's going on and like more you know better than i in terms of family systems but the sense of um what is it like to let those things go and and the re- just exactly use it the relief of that but also the very profound poignancy of of what does it what are we really letting go of ultimately and and where does that also feel like a lack of connection and i think a lot of it just starts to be it's you're in that that tension place of like you're beyond the tension you've done it i mean you're you're doing it <laughs> so but but there's still of course the heart pulls until we're fully enlightened the heart will <clears throat> you know kind of cling back to to certain aspects of it and just it's like that sense of where do you also trust the good feeling of that trust that actually the love that you might then feel is a much purer love right for your children or your grandchildren or your family whatever the you know, the the, the the broader framework of that that it's a that actually it's a purer love but it might not be as personal a love and that that isn't always something that feels familiar and so even just the lack of familiarity can be like disconcerting but that it's really beautiful to hear yeah thank you mm. kim Hi, um, thank you to both of you. It's so nice to see you. Um, I was also really struck um, by what you mentioned in the sutta about the blessing being in the doing and not in something that you're given. Um, and yeah, the the biggest challenge for me with my practice this year has been um, just self-compassion and forgiveness for the ways that I hadn't been doing um, skillful in, in the ways that that have hurt um, people really close to me. And um, so, yeah, it's a beautiful reminder. You know, it really is very simple. And um, one thing I've been doing in the morning um, that my parents do every day is reciting the precepts. And that's really helped with um, you know, if I if I find myself wanting to fudge my time card or something, it's like, oh no, refraining from taking what's not given. You know, it's it's so simple, um, but um, yeah, challenging when you know negative habits or patterns um, get in the way of 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 doing those skillful deeds. Um, so. I'm not sure what my question is exactly. I do have one that's sort of silly maybe, but you know, the, the fifth precept about refraining from intoxicants, um, that's one where I, I wonder if there's like flexibility to be mindful with the intoxicants <laughs> I'm taking, you know what I mean? Um, Cause I don't want to say them and then be out of integrity with keeping them. The modified um, precepts. <laughs> The modified precept. It's like, should I just not even be doing the fifth precept? Like, it seems sort of silly, you know? Yeah, so. Yeah, I don't think it's a silly question at all, but yeah, Michelle, you want to start? Oh boy. I just, uh, you're not giving maybe enough information for me to be too specific. Um, but I, I do, I would like to go like with our, Arlene, what Arlene was talking about, and then you, like I feel the willingness to be sad. And like, I just wanna say that that willingness to feel sorrow when we do, choose to consciously choose to let go of something like identity or um, alcohol or drugs that's the precept of like of refraining from it that it's really important to remember that it all has to do with what you said which is non-harming right 
I mean, that's what's so interesting is that these precepts are all about um, not harming ourselves and others and that 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 intention. Um, and so, you know, it's like, um, what I would encourage you to do is to pay attention to that, to pay attention to intention not to harm and carelessness because that that apamada the the carefulness of the precepts the carefulness of the intention and then the the seeing seeing if we have harmed often with um that fifth precept we're not so aware of how much we're harming ourselves and it's like it can and i think there's subtlety there's subtleties to it for sure um, and there's there's that line where it it goes from <laughs> I grew up with a lot of um, alcoholics uh, extreme and so I would watch that place of uh, uh, particularly I got to see it the most with my mom but that place between her wanting some joy like like this so desperate for something pleasant or something relaxing to just to just get some relief from the pain and i would even as a little kid before i could talk i could see like that shift into how so short it was like it was so short and it was so um, transitory, but it was all she had to hold on to. And then I would watch it backfire on her, like every time, just like, ugh. and just um, how scary that was to watch for me. Like, um, so that wanting to lose yourself and then to, um, and to feel that kind of almost ecstasy of like losing oneself and then really losing yourself <laughs> like there do you see what i mean like there's there it's such a fine line um and i think what would you want me to say <laughs> like you know what i mean like i i have a body that i really couldn't get away with anything anyway so like i i just like uh i don't I don't, I don't have a body that ever allowed me to play that edge that some people seem to play very much. It's like, um, but that like that to just pay, if you are, if you are um, playing that edge that I would just encourage uh, to pay attention to how short the relief is and how long the um, loss of self is from it. You know, that's what I would pay attention to. <laughs> that's that's all i can say you know is it worth that's, it that's useful yeah thank you yeah yeah and yeah, I, I think i would just add that you know if you look at the the precepts of refrain from harmful speech or wrong speech it isn't to say that if you then do something harmful say something harmful during the day that like that that like you should have this sort of sort of overwhelming sense of remorse and um but but there is a sense of measurement right it's like oh i have this intention i made this commitment today and then conditions arose that made it actually very hard for me to to um hold that commitment and and this happened and that was the impact and then you live with the comma of it internally and externally and in the relationship you know um i think with like the intoxicants that question of like, is it your intention to hold the precept, basically, like when you wake up in the morning, is that the intention? And if it is, and that there are times where you don't hold it and times where you do, that it's like an important reflection on something, right? Of this sense of like, wow, I see how much I'm not holding it. Or with speech, right? The sense of like, gosh, every day I start to realize I'm like really being kind of toxic with speech in a certain way and there's like learning in that that's valuable and if it's like oh i really realize i'm doing something in terms of intoxication in a certain way every day or, or building or whatever when certain stressors arise that there's something important to learn from that and integrate into the spiritual path but i think your actual suggestion that if it is not your intention to hold the precept that you shouldn't take it 
right? That if you're like, well, I'm in a place in my life where like I'm doing something different, uh, then I actually think it's important. It'll, it'll, it won't turn it into just a sort of mindless rite and ritual of like, oh, I do the precepts in the morning and therefore like whatever. It's like, no, I'm going to take the precepts that I'm going to try to keep and like, I'll try not to kill anyone today. Or, right. It's like these, some of them are easier than others. And the sense of like, okay, where that might be um, something to do, but also to reflect upon like, okay, why is it, you know, just kind of as Michelle was saying, it's like, oh, where is the challenge around this one? And, and what is it that's, you know, often I'll just, it's like the sense of most of the precepts are trying to protect us from the extreme, you know, uh, bits of craving, um, whether it's like around, um, you know, things or sex, right? It's like, where are we just protecting ourselves and others from the extremity of craving? Where are we protecting ourselves from the extremity of aversion around harmful actions, right? Around violence. Um, And then, where are we protecting ourselves from delusion in the world around us? And then, yeah, there are these interesting ways that human humanity have figured out to like intentionally induce a little delusion to kind of take the edge off of how intense things feel. Um, and yeah, what are the consequences of that? What are the potential consequences? And, and just that sense of like, right, we always are responsible for that. And, you know, yeah. Where does that put us, you know? Kim, I do want to I do want to add to that for something Jesse said because like I was at the farmers market the other day and mm. uh, <laughs> it was like I'm not going to say what I said but I was like super crowded and super I was super tired blah 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 right all of my excuses but like it was this incredibly long lines everywhere and um, I came late because of something that I actually helped somebody with and. I'm like at the last end of this line for my, for eggs, you know, and these eggs are really good, nice eggs. And I'm like waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting. And there's this person up like at the counter, this little booth counter that um, was so like not aware of like how long she was taking. And like, it was, it was really truly like um, a test that I did not, I did not win this test at all. And everybody else was like, you could see everybody was steaming and just so upset. And just this person just completely oblivious to like how long, she, the, the asking questions and, you know, checking each egg and each thing and checking each tomato. And like, it's like, you know, and I, I, I actually blurted something out that I couldn't believe I said, like, I couldn't believe it. And it came out really loud. I don't think I've ever had this experience before where it was like a thought actually, <laughs> an aversive thought came out so loud. And the guy in front of me, a young guy turned around and he's like, I can't believe you just said that. And I said, I can't believe I said it either. It's like humiliating. And he was laughing because he said, we're all thinking it, but you shouldn't say that. And I <laughs> totally know I shouldn't have said that. And then he, it sort of gave him permission. He like went up to this booth next door, the goat cheese place. And he talked the goat cheese lady into getting him eggs. Like, I don't know how he even did this. He gave the right amount of money. He got the eggs. He came back and he said, see what you encouraged me to do. I'm like, this isn't fair. <laughs> this is so funny. But the whole, the I, I'd say for hours, like my system was reverberating. Like it was so um, painful. Like the, like the feeling of like um, <laughs> wrong speech, man. It was like, there was no sugar coating it. It was like really not okay. And uh you know, I really, I'm going to try harder <laughs> to do that ever again. It was really intense. So I, I, it's not like I feel like I have to um, hurt myself with self-hatred. It's more just to pay attention to how um, not okay it was. Like, and to, to really make an intention to not do it again. So I, I don't know if that's helpful, but I think where, where people tend to, we all tend to get messed up with this stuff is that it's, um, there's a feeling like if you, if you decide to do it and then you feel like something's wrong with it, it's, and then you get into self-hatred and judgment, it's not, it's not a good, it's not a good path. It just isn't. 
it just doesn't, it's not helpful. So that's all I can say. My family did teach me that too. I have an older sister that's awesome. She's just like, a, not on my path. And, you know, she teaches me a lot about that. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Uh, before Harry, I just want to, uh, Carolyn had a question here in the chat of um, just tips for dealing with the loss of a loved one during the holidays. Um, I'm sure each of us might say a little bit about it. I think, you, Michelle, should I, should I can start? Is that all right? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think. You know, I, Carolyn, I don't know the context in, in which you're asking and, you know, who the person might be and how long it's been. I, you know, of course, it's, it's of the many reasons why the holidays can be like of the, you know, sort of such like joyous times and also the most challenging times. You know, there, there are various reasons around families that it can be so challenging. And, and of course, something like this is, is one of them. I mean, I, I think... I may start just with my own, something I noticed this year. My dad passed away about 10 years ago, coming on, I think, 10 years ago. And um, just to see how, what a process sort of it continues to be around that for me has been really amazing. And um, what I'll say is I noticed this year um, around the sort of anniversary of his death, it was really the sense of like I hesitate to say it because I, I think of course there's all these ways in which it can be misinterpreted and um this kind of thing cannot be helpful. But I wasn't i I'm like I, I don't feel sad anymore. And Instead of that, what I what occurred to me and what continues to occur to me is like all the things I loved about my dad and how great he was and um, and just like how deeply appreciative um, I am of so much that, that he offered in my life and how different that is for me in terms of maybe how it was nine years after or eight years after or seven years after or six years after and without any judgment of that whole process right and that certainly in the first three years you know it was very hard and um and especially around holidays very poignant you know and continued to be um you know, have its sadness and the sort of shadow of that on family gatherings and things like that. And there are other members of my family who are still very aggrieved about my, you know, father's passing and other ones who maybe weren't, weren't as much ever or whatever. The idea that like, that it's like, we all have our way around this and that it's not always, there's some things can be shared in the sort of early stages of loss that aren't always shared in terms of how it progresses over time, which I think can be very interesting and difficult, right? Where if you feel still sort of more like really wanting to honor someone's memory at a holiday and other people feel like they're over it and they don't, you know, or whatever it's the path, whatever other ways people might be processing it or not processing it, um, you know, that can bring up kind of, you know, obviously very difficult sort of dynamics. But I do feel like there is something that can be very valuable in terms of a family if there is a family gathering and if there is a loss that still feels for anyone to be painful and to have some time of like reflection that's conscious, you know, of like, oh, let's, let's spend some moments like reflecting on this person and how we miss them or if it's Thanksgiving, it's like, you know, the gratitude that we have for them. There are ways of um, allowing for that honesty and the space of sadness and grief and loss and, and, and rejoicing in people and, or remembering their complexity or, you know, all of the ways that we might remember them in a shared way, because none of us have the same experience, same relationship with anyone, you know, it's all going to be a range. 
Um, but that can be, I think, a really helpful way of like carving out some time where that is, you know, it doesn't have to be long, but we're something we do together. Um, but it doesn't have to also feel like the whole thing is dominated by it. On the other hand, if it's a very recent loss, it's going to be a much obvious, it's going to be a more shared pain in, in a more general way um, for people. And that can be very hard. And sometimes it means like really kind of changing traditions. Sometimes it means, you know, um, spending sort of a little more time for that, maybe putting less pressure on everyone having like a really good time and pretending this thing hasn't happened um, and, and, and holding a little bit more space for the grief, you know. Um, and then it's not always a factor of time, but, you know, sometimes it is just many years go by and there are just sort of simple ways my niece got married this fall and um, it was beautiful. They had a little kind of altar area of honoring all the people who had passed away before this could happen. And of course, who would have, you know, been rejoicing and, and um, very much involved in it. And I think there's something with any kind of celebration that we have of like, where do we remember the dead and remember, you know, those who've passed on, even if it was 20, 30, 40, 50 years ago, longer, right? The sense of where do we honor these things, these, these human cultural ceremonies, traditions as part of a lineage and part of where we come from and, um, and the people who can't be there. It's always a really important thing to, to have space for that. Michelle, anything you want to say? Oh, yeah. Just three little things. One is sometimes I think if you're with other people, even if it isn't with your family, but you've lost somebody, it's nice to maybe have somebody know that you're sad and like somebody at the gathering or before you leave for a gathering, or even if you're home alone, <laughs> however it is to, to at least reach out to somebody and let somebody know that you're sad and just kind of have a witness with you. And one, two, an altar, to really have an altar where you light a candle and um, call the I don't think every, anyone ever disappears. I think uh, things change, and, but I think you can send metta to that being wherever they are and feel connected. And everything Jesse said, yeah, other than that, but I, I think it's good to call in the beings. Like Jesse said that there was an altar at his niece's wedding, that, it, that the altars I think are very important. Yeah, and I actually just want to say, because it says it's just over a year ago. If it feels like the, your, the family and people are open to this sense of like, let's do something together and you light a candle and there's some sense of sacredness to the time you create, like that's like wonderful and incredible and use it, right? Do just, it could be very simple and short, but do it. There definitely may be a circumstance where it feels like people are not, you people don't have the space or capacity or interest to kind of like go into that with you or in a shared way um that's like totally depending on our family conditions and everything and so just to know that like you you may just have to do a more private ceremony right that the altar is something you have in your room or your space or you go outdoors and you you share the merit of the holiday, of the meal, of whatever, of the goodness, of you do some work connecting with the spirits, you know, beyond this one person, just like the spirit world that's out there that is sensitive, you know, and that, that responds to um, relationship and invitation um, to definitely the sense of like, there are plenty of times where it's like, okay, you just have to kind of go do it yourself in a quiet way and know that you're taking care of your family and that as well, right? That, that they may not have the sort of resources to sort of jump into that um, or feel really safe or comfortable with it. But that in doing that, it's like you're connecting with this person 
um, you know, you're attending to them during a time where, of course, right, depending on whatever condition they are and they may wish they were back or they may be in some other lifetime now doing, having more fun or whatever, but the sense of like you're attending to that, but in that you're holding something for your family, even if they're not able to feel like they can participate. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. Harry. Let's see. Oh, we got to unmute there. Yeah, I, I, I don't want to transition too rapidly. So in response to what you just said, my father died two days after Thanksgiving in 1983. And it's a tender time for me. And I feel more love and joy and treasure and gratitude for his wonderful being. And I feel sadness still. So I just be with that. And I'll, I might share it with Kathy, but I don't. It's so long ago, I don't, uh, there's other people's deaths we're going to deal with at the family gathering this year in a public way. But anyway, the reason I, I, before I, you, before you go in, I want to just say that, thank you for saying that part around, like, I just happen to be in this place 10 years in and who knows how it'll be five years later or, and, and the sense uh, of no, that, no, right. No, like, no. I don't want to try to say that, like, we should get over sadness. At oh, any no, point. no, no. I didn't so, take like, it that yeah, way. It is great. what it yeah. is. And it goes yeah. and comes and some Thanksgivings it's like, you know, give me the turkey or something, you know, but you know, the reason I put up my hand was in response to Michelle. And it's kind of, it really, as she was talking, it reminds me of the honeymooners and Ralph Cramden. And Ed <laughs> if anybody remembers this and Norton is, is, is sitting at the table getting ready and he's fussing and he's putting up his arms and he's doing this and everything. And so many times in my life, I feel just like this. Norton or Cramden is standing behind him and he's fuming and everything. And he goes, Come on, you know, it just jumps out. And so it reminds me of one thing that I heard uh, Robert Bly say one time, when the giant archetype is engaged, it's always followed by shame. And that's what happened, you know, and I think I have to be ready for the shame and just just be with the shame and and and, and let let that go through. But I just I can't you talking about that. I can't tell you how many times. <laughs> I've been in situations. I always think of that. That <laughs> anyway, that's all I have to say. <laughs> I was I was just so happy the lady didn't hear what I said. <laughs> oh oh, oh. But everybody else heard it, and they were happy. They were actually grateful. I said it. Yeah, it was like wait, but it was really not okay. And I think yeah, yeah, I think I, that it it does hit you that you know. Hey, it, we're all human. <laughs> I know. And I also thought about like the pandemic, pandemic, and I'm alone a lot. And I talk to myself and I think it was just sort of like, I just like, oh, I completely kind of forgot. I was like with, you know, a hundred people, you know, just not okay. You know, I'm glad you said that, Ralph, right? <laughs> the honeymooners. <laughs> Spiritual teacher. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> sort of. Sort <laughs> of. There is a cool thing too, you know, Anushka is just reminding our yogis about this a few days ago. And Steve sometimes mentions this story of, in the suttas of some monk who got fully enlightened, um, but continued to just have these speech patterns that were like really like abusive, you know? <laughs> and and then these monks went to the Buddha and were like, what is wrong with this guy? It's just like, why doesn't he stop, you know? And the Buddha was like, no, he's realized, like he's done. But you, what you guys can't see is that he had, you know, a thousand lifetimes where he was X or Y and, and, and the momentum of that comma just built up that it's just like, it's just going to keep playing out. Like, don't worry about it. It's not personal. you know. So not that we can use that excuse uh, or should use that excuse, but to know that we also might not totally understand all of the, the karmic implications of it to either, you know? <laughs> anyway, thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Harry. Oh, all right, friends. Well, I think it's time to call it a day. Mm. Wonderful to be here with you all again. Let's take a quick look again through who's left here. Yeah. And um, yeah, we've 
good luck making it through another week of <laughs> gain and loss and praise and blame and all the goodies. And um, hopefully we'll see you again next Sunday. Oh, mm. next Sunday is actually, okay. we're going to be, we're holding a five day online retreat. And so next Sunday, Sunday sitting will be um, just a Dhamma talk from that. Just so you know, there won't be a Q and A, there won't be a guided thing and we'll send it out on the email beforehand, but just heads up. Uh, yeah. Okay. Have Take care, day. everyone. Yeah. Meta.